I will not barbecue him. <laughs> we are back from Graceland, and you're listening to the Southern Fried Philosophy Podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a brand new episode of the Southern Fried Philosophy Podcast, where it's two guys' take on life, liberty, and the pursuit of gravy, and you, the listener, are getting a degree in common sense. We are broadcasting live from the HB5 studios right here in beautiful downtown historic Concord, North Carolina. I'll be your host, Biggin. How about you? We've got a great show lined up for you, as always. But before we begin, let me introduce you to the second half of this flaky biscuit. That's right. I'm talking about the pride of Anderson, South Carolina. He is 2016's honorable mention male hand model of the year. The inventor of the redneck egg roll. Give it up on old Mike number one. It's Mojo! Hey, buddy. I'm just trying to hear my intro music. What's up, everyone? Thanks for listening again to the Southern Fry Philosophy Podcast. That just ended abruptly. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you get. That's how usually how it ends anyway. So. <laughs> anyway, appreciate you tuning in as always. You can find us on the interwebs at southernfryphilosophy.com. Also on Twitter and Instagram at SFP Radio. Facebook's at Southern Fry Philosophy. And uh, YouTube channel now. Boom. Yeah, SFP Radio. Thanks for big and putting that up because uh, evidently I, I had one too many brain cells dedicated to my network and Netflix uh, binging session. So mm-hmm. couldn't figure that out. <laughs> anyway, appreciate you guys tuning in. Please go to Google play iTunes or the podcast store on iTunes, um, Stitcher and uh, subscribe. Give us a like, uh, also share our episodes. We Please do that. a lot of that. A lot of people have been doing that. Um, also I appreciate our new listeners. Uh, we have all around the globe right now. And also some of the new states have kind of picked us, uh, been picking us up and listening to us. So we appreciate you guys as always. Let her eat, Bo. I'm I'm gonna need Africa to get in get in the game here. Yeah. And I think South America are the only two that uh, two we just need left, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's it. I don't I don't think they track on Antarctica, so we, <laughs> we count that out. <laughs> but uh, as always, man, Australia is starting to pick up. Come so, on, yeah. bring it, Aussies. Yeah. I, I wonder how many Outback Steakhouses they have there. Uh, probably zero. Probably I'll zero. give you that zero. Yeah. I, th- I I think you're right. Do they get at, they get upset when we say fish on the barbie? You think? Because I mean that's the only thing I got. From Australia, <laughs> like just from watching Crocodile Dundee. Hey, that's not a knife. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. How many times do you think, you know, people get off the plane and throw another shrimp on the bob, eh? Yeah. How how sick do they get of that? Yeah, th- but I wonder if there's like a uh, instead of an Outback Steakhouse in mm-hmm. Australia, if there's an American version steakhouse or whatever, you know, <laughs> Texas Roadhouse. How about that? Could be. They Could got be. the Texas Roadhouse kicking down in Australia. Mm. Well, I'm going to ask you like I ask you every week. Mojo, how you be darn? What burns my biscuits? Oh, no. Once again, mm. I've been married for 20 years. Uh, we count those in dog years, mm-hmm. so it's uh, 140 if you're a dog. <laughs> but um, mm. my old lady just don't know how to hang her keys up on the key Ooh. hook that I have installed by the door. <laughs> a little bit of a handle, huh? Ah. <sighs> And I have a backup set of keys mm-hmm. for the for emergency situations. So. Mm. But yeah, the whole hanging the key thing up, and then she spends twenty minutes, you know, walking around mm-hmm. wondering where her keys are. Maybe and uh, we just yeah, put it there. I just you know, uh, the little three dollar key hook thing I bought <laughs> is probably invaluable. I'm just saying. Yeah. Can you get one of those like little tracker things that? I'm sure I can, can but on. half the fun is watching her walk around <laughs> looking for keys <laughs> or blaming me or one of the, you know. In her defense, she that helps her get her 10,000 steps in, I guess. Yeah, I guess, I guess she probably needs to uh, reset her pedometer on that because, uh, <laughs> yeah, every it seems like it's almost daily. And really? Then, that of course, bad? You know, the, I used to have to hide the keys in my truck, but then, I was, <laughs> but then again, I was like, what if you know, I lock my keys in my truck? Right. I can't get the back That's keys. not a good idea. But, uh, yeah, so, she, so the other day I went to get in the car and, she had both sets of her keys in her, in her pocketbook. I'm like, come on. Y'all, come on, chick. That's the emergency one. You can't touch that? Yeah. Come I, need, on. I guess I need spray paint it red or something. Mm. But yeah, that's... Uh, what about like the valet key? Do you have like one of those? No, we didn't get one of the mm. valet keys. Uh, actually, I haven't searched the glove, glove box. It probably is in there. Like Maybe all the so. way down to the bottom? 
that or under the next to the under the seat next to the uh, uh, used breath mint or the pack of crackers. Pack of, do you, do you, do you have a pack of crackers in your? I uh, man, I'm probably sure there's probably a half a meal down there. There's probably some cheese down there too. I'm sure from my little youngin. Mm, so. That sounds delicious. So how you be doing, buddy? Oh, buddy, mm, it was um it was my wife's birthday this week, this mm-hmm. past week. So um, happy birthday, Jess. There you go. I I don't know at what point it went from celebrating a birthday to celebrating the birth week. Before long, it'll be a month. It, that's how it starts <laughs> out. Um, we were her birthday was Thursday, and we were real. I was really busy with work on Thursday. Couldn't do anything to celebrate. I actually the idea was to take Friday off and then have the weekend where we could go go away for the weekend and have a good time. Um, but then a speaker came in Asheville, and she wanted to go listen to the speaker on Saturday. Okay. So um, so Friday I took off and spent that time serving my wife in the DMV because uh, <laughs> <laughs> so she wouldn't have to spend any time yeah. there. I was like, look, it's your birthday week. I'll I'll take care of it. That's I couldn't true do anything for right you there. on Thursday, right? Well, mm, I wish it. I wish that was the end of it. <laughs> and then uh, we also had to go out, you know, for for dinner on Thursday. Right. We, we were able to do that on Thursday. And then Friday, DMV. Also, mm, let's go out at your birthday. Or she said, I want to go out. It's my birthday. Okay, that's that's Friday. Saturday, let's just chill. Um, she she went to go her, 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 do her thing. I stayed home, chilled, didn't, mm-hmm. didn't do anything. And then Tuesday was her birthday gift. Uh, that was last night and went to another concert. <laughs> Tell me it was like uh, the reunion, reunion of the Spice Girls. Was that it? No. Um, it was John Mayer. Well, you know what? That he's not as bad as... Uh, Sam Hunt. Sam Hunt. <laughs> and yeah. I get that. Um, how, la- how, how late were you guys out? It wasn't as bad this time. Okay. It, it ended about 10, 10, 10, 30 or so. Oh, wow. We were home probably all. by 11, 30. Traffic wasn't horrible. My wife, being the smart one, said, hey... Let's go ahead and get out a little bit early. So we left. The music was still, it was the encore. We're like, mm, we'll just head out. Um, but I, I can't, there's nothing that I can do to convince this woman how much <laughs> I don't like going to concerts. Well, well, obviously you need to have her listen to this podcast. So she can hear. <laughs> <laughs> I have begged and pleaded. And I've said, please, I don't, I don't want to go to another concert. But then she gives me those eyes. One, I mean, I'm dead at that point. And then round two is, well, it's my birthday. So mm. then you got it. And then, so I made it in my head. I'm not going to complain about anything. I'm going to be a good boy. I'm going to enjoy the concert. I'm going to love it. Mm. It was so sticky out there. It was worse than like. Oh, yeah. It was hot. A movie it. theater floor. Like, yeah. it was so sticky. Like, everything was just nasty. Um, the the people watching was a little bit different. Hmm. You didn't have Big Mama What What. There, mm-hmm. you had um, a series of people that evidently the modesty bus dro- dropped off, which I was very thankful for. That um, girls were actually covering themselves. Right. I was happy about that. There were there was uh, teenagers that went all the way to older adults, you right. know, that did enjoy his music. Um, but I could not get past the uh, contact buzz. For me, the entire night, <laughs> <laughs> there was so much weed that was being uh, partaken of that I couldn't. I, one, I I've, I've never done it, right? But and I, the smell just, ugh, I hate the smell. Um, but then halfway through, I'm like, I'm incredibly hungry right now, and I can't <laughs> shake this right now. Um, so we we got out, and both my wife and I went to the QT and just like loaded up on hot dogs for well, whatever reason. Yeah, she went. She's like, I need a uh, an icy, like you know those yeah. Coke ices. She's like, I need one of those right now. I'm like, mm, well, there you go. There's your contact buzz right there, lady. Wow. So there was a lot of that going on. Really there. well. It's uh, I know John Mayer was on tour with the mm. uh, kind of the, uh, the Grateful Dead, Grateful Dead yeah. the uh, kind of a a uh, remembrance tour, mm-hmm. and uh, so I'm sure they've picked up a few fans. He, he's probably picked up a different oh, sure. fan base from that. So it, it was funny. He played uh, "My Body Is a Wonderland," mm. and that's a very girl sound, you mm-hmm. know, girl song. And and halfway through, he said, "Okay," he just stopped. And he said, "Okay, guys, I'm halfway through. If you're here for because of the Grateful Dead, the trio." Whatever, I'm halfway through this song, so just bear with me a little bit longer, <laughs> and, and, and we'll, we'll pull through this one together. <laughs> That's awesome. So I will give him that. He is a, he's a, quite a comedian on stage, yeah. so it was pretty. That part was I've pretty heard funny. he puts on a good show. Uh, actually, about uh, probably about nine forty-five last night, I got a mm-hmm. text from uh, Dave Bittner, 
mm. uh, the guy who's I'm personal training with, and yeah. also he was on episode 18 okay. of our podcast. He yep. goes, is JT here? Yeah. I was like, yeah. Make sure you go up and behind him and grab him in the rear. Mm. There was somebody grabbing me from the rear. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it's I don't think he found you. But <laughs> he said he thought he saw you there. I was like, oh, wow, probably. Wow. So there you go. Probably. He had uh, he had to take his son to the mm. concert. So um, I will say those that um, those teenagers, boy, they like the selfies. <sighs> boy, they like the selfies. It's a psychological disorder. It's, there's a couple studies that have already proved that. Uh, and and I don't understand why, as a group, after you take the selfie, you all scream as loud as you can. Like I don't understand that psychology. Like after the selfie. After the I, selfie, everybody's screaming like, "Yay, we completed a selfie!" Like mission hmm. accomplished. I guess I so, guess. but as high pitched as you possibly could, <laughs> over and over and over again. Well, they're extremely proud, I guess. I guess so. And and to the to the young lady that was in front of me, I don't think your parents allowed you to buy the hat that just had the F word on it. Might need to get rid of that. Maybe not. Yeah, maybe mm. not. But who, who knows in today's parenting, <laughs> anything goes. So, Would you let your daughter wear that? F word, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say it. I won't put it on a shirt. Wow. There you go. Jeez. So, What's your next concert? Um... Just the only thing that I would like to to attend the concert is the musical toots after a Mexican restaurant dinner, <laughs> well, like a buffet. Well, there like, you go. I could put on a show for that. You got your own personal burp, mariachi burp, band. Burp, burp, burp. Yep, yep. I'm sure. I'm sure your wife uh, has another concert. I'm sure plan she for you. does. Okay. I just I have to ask her what it Probably is. Probably Miranda Lambert. I hope not. What would be so. the worst concert that you could go to? Uh, John Tesh. <laughs> Or Yanni. Yanni. Yeah. Yeah. One of those, one of those two, I think. Mm. I, I think that would probably drive me nuts. Would you rather go to a concert or would you go to the ballet or opera? If you had to pick John Tesh concert, the ballet or the opera? Probably the opera. Really? Yeah. Or ballet. Huh. I've actually, actually once, a, once upon a time I was cultured. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> kind of enjoyed those two because we really because we did a lot of caterings and events okay. for right. for those stars. So I I actually got it. No, I wouldn't get into. I'm not like a you know like a like a uh, a group or anything like that. Right. But, but I kind of enjoy that and kind of it's a, it's a beautiful art. And I'm sure John Tesh is great, but <laughs> it's just not my kind of art. Mm-mm. No, I think I'll stay away. Yeah. Hmm. Um, I don't know. I feel like that at a concert, at least you can have food. Like nachos, All right? You couldn't sneak that into the ballet. Well, well, au contraire, ballets and uh, operas actually have a full liquor bar. Wait, what? Yeah, oh yeah. Well, now I'm out. And sometimes, if you pay a few extra bucks, mm-hmm. they actually have a pre-opening ceremony where you can actually go ahead and drink decent quality scotch and gin mm. and bourbon ahead of time with hors d'oeuvres. Hmm. So you might want to rethink that strategy then. I will say that I think the best concert that I ever went to was. <clears throat> I, and I don't even know how I was able to go. Well, I do know, like a buddy of mine is really connected with some people in Charlotte. And um, he had some tickets to Hootie. Yeah. Mm. What, what's his name? Darius Rucker. Darius Rucker. Yeah. And it was like a really small event, like right. maybe a thousand people. Like and the Fillmore or something like that? It wasn't even the Fillmore. It was like a um, like a little thing down the arts center i think downtown okay so it, okay. i don't know if you've been there or not but no, just a small little venue has a balcony and whatnot but it was like free free drinks and things like that so i did have a, a bourbon and but it was like the high class people i i don't like i'm completely out of the league on this one mm-hmm. yeah i know the arts district here in charlotte <laughs> yeah. is uh is definitely a, a little above above my brows it's the people i right. it's the people i would cook for privately in their homes and not be shown <laughs> right, <laughs> so, right but uh yeah, it's, exactly. a little, it's a little higher brow. And um, I was uh, really excited. I, I only had one, and it was a, a one drink. But I, when I went to stand up, I spilled it on the guy in front of me, oh. and it went all over his jacket, mm. and I just felt like I just wanted to cry mm. the entire time. But this show was amazing. I was seven rows from from Hootie, from Darius. Darius. Mm-hmm. I bet he, he does put on a good show. Yeah, so I I've, enjoyed that one. Yeah. I'll, I'll I'm a... That. I'm a South Carolina kid, so mm. Darius and Hootie and the Blowfish were pretty pretty instrumental. Plus, his country album yeah. is actually decent. So, yeah, um, yeah, he's he has a special place in my heart. Plus, he, he's always giving back to his hometown in Charleston. So, mm. you gotta kind of admire that. Um, maybe we'll have him on the show one day. That would be actually. I'm, I'm working that angle. Are you really? Yeah, I got a buddy of mine who's uh, 
connected up with them. So we're trying. Win play show. Hopefully. We, yeah. Whoa. Be nice with it. Hey, buddy. I would love that. If not, I'll have a reasonable impersonator. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we need to do. <laughs> I don't want to be with you. That's yeah. all he says. The, every question we ask. I don't yeah. want to be with you. Yeah. <laughs> You're a little huh? Yeah. 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 We should just get people that do, do <laughs> interviews, like fake people, and just just interview them. Yeah, yeah. Like, Next up, we have Donald Trump calling in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that that'll take this to a whole new level. Yeah, Speaking actually. of, I think we already have. Um, one thing that we can't ignore for this year um, or this week is Charlottesville. And hey, there was some stuff that happened this week. So, mm. do you want to share your thoughts on on what went down and? Where we're at. Well, I'm sure, if, unless you're hiding under a rock. And maybe you are. And no judgment. We, and we appreciate you listening from your rock. Um, but yeah, Charlottesville, uh, wow, what a grab bag of, uh, of thoughts there. And I, in my older age here, <laughs> I've I'm, I'm been less to, I haven't, I've never had that, I, I don't have that knee-jerk reaction response. Mm, it, right. you know, a lot of people automatically feel they have to respond. Yep. And that's fine, too. Uh, I'm not saying I'm any wiser. Just I, I've learned that sometimes when you let when you let the dust settle and the facts start to come mm-hmm. out, um, you kind of start to see some things different, maybe different perspective. Maybe some common uh, sense of just take a break, sure, take a breath, and then let it let it let it sit. But um, as a Christian and as a human being of mankind, uh, and I'm, I'm big and I'm sure you'll relate to or mm-hmm. you'll I'll back you. Yeah, on this. That's right. That we on this show and also in our personal lives do not. Um, can do not condone, mm. do not approve of any nope. type of type of bigotry or racism, um, no sir, or any type of even religious stabbing. I mean, we're just you know, we're 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 people who love mankind and love our fellow man, mm-hmm. um, and we just we we feel that the greatest or one of the greatest commandments is love thy neighbor, mm-hmm. and then we try to live that way. So, kind of want to get that out of the way first. But um, Charlottesville, um, I think we're kind of missing the boat on this. <laughs> Because um, these two groups that showed showed up there for Charlottesville, and, and I, I don't think the mayor or the vice mayor of uh, Charlottesville did anything to squash this. I, I think they this is a powder keg that they wanted to see erupt. Hmm. But these two groups of people that showed up, you know, with the nationalist or white nationalist or the neo Nazis or the skinheads, whatever group you have there on the on one side and the other side is this antifa. Mm-hmm. Um, these two groups, they got the exact result that they wanted. Yeah. They definitely. wanted punches to be thrown. They yeah. wanted blood. They wanted uh, people hurt. Mm-hmm. And they got exactly what they wanted. Yeah. So this is, I mean, can we be mad about it? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. But when people play stupid games, they get stupid prizes. And right. this is exactly what they wanted. Yeah. So the common sense voices out there, I'm sure most of you guys feel the same way, is that we're not out there protesting. We're not out there beating drums and trying to, you know, beat our next door neighbor up just because mm-hmm. he's opposing view. But we have to kind of slow down. I think um, you we have to we have to realize that we live in the, in a country of 330 million people. Mm-hmm. We're going to have differing opinions yeah. on a, a variety of things. Yep. But we can agree to disagree, and we can do it in a respectful manner. We can do it with words and not punches. Yeah. So, um, what happened with the, the the killing of the young the young lady? I think she's mm-hmm. thirty two. Yeah. What a, what a travesty! And we, I mean, the person who hit her obviously uh, will be held in a court in a court trial, yeah. and um, probably held. Uh, will probably spend a few years in prison. I bet. Oh yeah. And um, but. Even with that said, I think there's probably going to be some new news come out about that pretty soon because they had cameras everywhere. So we'll sure. see the yeah. see the events leading up to that, that which doesn't give approval to him, you know, slamming his four thousand pound car into a crowd of people by no sure. means. Right. But um, this will be held in, in court. A trial will, will happen, and you know, a jury of his peers will probably decide his fate. And we have to leave it to that because that's part of the justice system. But um, just what a cluster. I mean, yeah. I, I, you know, our church, you know, stood up Sunday and, and, uh, it, 
condone or condemn the <laughs> be the, careful which one you use there. <laughs> condemn the, you know the racist history that we've had mm-hmm. and we we can't hide behind no. we can't hide that um and also so also if we have racism in our hearts you know we uh, which some of us do i right. mean or probably all of us yeah but i i just i think that we're so quick to react and a lot of that's the media the media's fault <laughs> exactly I mean, when Especially with cell phones, when everyone has a cell phone in their hand, everyone is a reporter. Um, you got a Periscope live, and all <laughs> yeah, that, absolutely. You know, all that. But I, th- I just think that we're so reactionary to yeah. these things. If I wonder if we didn't have cameras there, how quickly these protests would die. Well, I think that they're they're going for that reaction, right? So no, they're doing the exact thing that was they're baiting media, they're baiting people, they're baiting they're baiting their their reactions to that. So. Right. <clears throat> I don't, I'm with you, and, and I'll back you on that, that I condemn uh, those acts. I, I condemn bo- both acts, the Antifa, mm. uh, I condemn the white supremacy, mm. I condemn the Black Lives Matter mm-hmm. that uh, that want to, that call for killing of anybody. Mm-hmm. Any, any group that wants to kill another person. Right. I don't. I don't want to have any part of that. And these these groups are vast. We have them all over the country, right. and they represent all all cross, all shades of color. I mean, you right. have La Raza, which is the race by is a Hispanic group that mm-hmm. uh, tries to do perpetration of hate, and uh, I mean, there's just so many groups out there. Yeah, so. I, I just it's frustrating, and, and then you hear <clears throat> the powder keg of well, in the South they're mm-hmm. trying to take take away our heritage, or they're trying to take away our flag, or they're trying to take away our sense of. The, the Confederacy and the Union. Mm-hmm. And can I just tell you, can we just say that that was the past and we should we should learn from that and it should be historical. It should be in it should be in a museum. But but we shouldn't if, if that gets you that upset about it. I need you to 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 praise the Lord that that's the only thing you got worried mm-hmm. about, because if if having a flag come down is going to disrupt your daily life. That's going to affect your kids. That's going to impact your your paycheck. Then maybe you can get upset about it. But guys, it's a flag. You know, I, I don't have have any notion that that having a Confederate flag is going to make me any less Southern. Mm. That's going to make me any less of a person. Mm-hmm. I, I don't even like have a deal with the flag. But if it's going to cause somebody to stumble, or if it's going to cause somebody to be upset at you, or it's going to make somebody think that you're racist, then get rid of it. Just dump it. Like, it's not important. And it's going to, as as Christians, it's going to cause us to um, to be viewed in a light that, that that's not what Christ wants. So my thought is get rid of it, that if, if, if you're hanging on to that because of your Southern pride, or get rid of it because yeah, of Christ. Yeah. I think that uh, you have two sides of the picture, even two sides of the coin on that. You know, and I guess... Like I said, first of all, mm-hmm. we're Christian, right. but we're also American, and we have to abide by the Constitution. Exactly. And, you know, the Constitution speaks of free speech. Mm-hmm. And you never you want to kind of tread lightly on how you trample on that. It should never be sure. trampled on, because um, with with this huge issue of heritage, this is a, this is a slippery slope, mm. because you're already seeing, not only are we seeing these statues, the call for these statues to be removed. Um, we're also seeing the call for statues now for George Washington to be removed, Thomas Jefferson, right, um, Jackson, and even t- even today FDR. They were, there was a protest out in front of a New York library today remove FDR's uh, statue. So, but actually, there's no calls for the Vladimir Lenin statue <laughs> in Seattle to be removed. Um, so once we go down this precipice we may not be able to get off of it. Right. So, and for me as a Southerner who has lineage back to the Confederacy, um, I I don't know if I want it to go away. I'm still, but the jury's still out Mm -hmm. on on that for me. All the reason, because I can put it in perspective for my daughters. Right. You know, when they ask about (laughs) these statues, which we talk about all the time. So it's a, it's a remembrance of a failed policy. Right. But also what the, what the South, was then, you know, right. 150 years ago, or 100, well, I can't yeah. really do the math in my head right now, but, um, so it, it gives, um, uh, it, it lends us a conversation piece. So just like, I don't want, I'm a, I, I do not 
approve of communism in, in one in one respect, right. but I have no problem with the Lenin statue being up in Seattle if that's what they want. That's that's actually a great place for it to be because it's a failed <laughs> policy. <laughs> right. So you know, make sure you understand. Like I don't I don't want to stop talking about history and learning about those things and teaching those things sure. that we've we've learned from the past. But but if me clinging to my southern heritage be a, a flag, no, I agree with that. that that causes people that my brothers and sisters find offensive, then maybe I say, well, I'm not going to cling to this flag. I'm going to cling to Christ, and, no, and I, I, we I'm can not... talk about it yeah. through that that flag sure. of how I've. What's your redemption story? We talk about that all the time. Yeah. Like, what's your redemption story from that flag? Sure. From that flag's point of view. No, so, I, no I, I agree with you on that because the heritage aspect, I, I can't, I can't gravitate towards. You know, with mm-hmm. with people that they have to always scream that Southern pride. Right. So, look, I'm proud. I'm, I'm proud. I'm, I'm gracious and glad that we live here in the South. Cause, sure. Um, just we got sweet tea. <laughs> I mean, need, we, need, we say, need we say <laughs> right. more but, I'll, uh, I'll hang a, a flag for sweet tea <laughs> there and you go. Rally, rally around that we'll just take the picture of the Chick-fil-A sweet tea oh that's some good yeah. tea but um, no it just, I just I think that we once we start going down this path of removing everything mm-hmm. then everything's going to be deemed right. bigotry or offensive to someone and it's going to it's going to start happening I've already right. seen peti- stupid petitions mm-hmm. of people trying to call out Martin Luther King statues to be torn down you know, but I mean, again, we the reason we, why is because he was against gay marriage. Yeah, I mean, we've we've got to get to a point where yeah. common sense prevails. This is a statue for this person, this thing, this idea. But we're going to teach the history about that here and why that's a positive or a negative, sure. and use that as a, a time where we can talk about it and yeah. debate and have those conversations instead of just ripping it out. Yeah, it's, I just I, I don't I don't uh, I just don't like some of the tactics that's happening, mm-hmm. and, and it seems like right now that the, the the speed of this happening right now with it's going so fast. it's going so fast yeah. and it is it is nothing but reactionary yeah. this is this is a, a hive mind or a, a mob mentality that's kind of starting yeah. to take over and we need cooler heads to prevail yeah and i i just don't think that uh it's going to happen anytime soon so I, I think we just need to take a chill pill people and we need to we need to let the dust settle before mm-hmm. we get all backed into our boat yeah. Packed into our boat and ready to sell off into the shores of, <laughs> of disdain and you know, trying to separation. We got it. We got to give it a day or two. So, yeah. well, and, and I'll say this: once you remove it, it's not coming back. Right. So let's let's think about that too. Sure. We want to get rid of it, but it's, if you ever try to bring that back, mm, hey buddy, yeah, that's never going to happen. So, well, and I hope hopefully that. people that know me on a personal level and also people that are getting to know me through this podcast. I mean, hopefully. They know that we we either one of us have any notion of hatred towards our fellow man, sure. regardless of color, creed, or whatever, sexual preference, or mm-hmm. you know who they want to be with. I I could care less. You know we love people for people. So, um, but there has to be a break. We we need some type of pause. We need a pause button mm-hmm. here so we can actually have some calm and rational conversations. That's and the for, key. Yeah, and for the people that want to pick up sticks and shields and go out there and beat on each other. That's not. That's going to get us nowhere. I mean, right. and honestly, I think a lot of these situations where they're being trumped up is actually getting to a point where it is nothing but propaganda to mm-hmm. get us just inflamed as a country. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's kind of our stance as a show, and I'll agree with you. You'll agree with me on sure. some points, and some some parts of the show we don't agree with well, each I mean, other, and that's there's, okay. There's parts that I'm right, and there's a lot of parts that you're wrong. So <laughs> no, <I'm just> kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that's what makes the show the show. All right, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to have uh, Wacky News with us. Hey, guys, it's me, Bigging. Summer is made for grilling and chilling, and you too can be the baddest mother smoker on the block using our favorite award-winning smoking sauce. Bad Mother Smokers is perfect match for that favorite meat, veggies, or even that secret ingredient in a pot of chili. Check out badmothersmokers.com to place your order, and if you want to be a barbecue pit master like Mojo, enter the promo code MOJO for 10% off your order. Visit badmothersmokers.com or the sponsor section of our website at southernfriedphilosophy.com. All right, we're back. Now time for some wacky news. Uh, 
Um, have you seen the movie The Purge? I have. I've seen one and two. And two made me not want to see three. <laughs> I actually watched the third one. Did you? Yeah. How was it? Yeah, it was awful. Yeah, that's why I didn't watch it. But basically, The Purge <laughs> is a movie about, uh, in the future, you have to, uh, there's one night, uh, I think every seven years or whatever, where people can go ballistic and just commit any crime that they want to. Sure. And it's it's free. Like, you, you get a pass to do whatever. Yeah, actually, if you, uh, I think the first episode of the, or first movie was, uh, I guess we had a civil war or something, or mm. there was a, a the new founding fathers where they rewrote the constitution. Right, still patriotic, still nationalistic, but you had this purge that was also involved. So it was basically just meant to uh, weed out the the less fortunate. I guess, right, the, the riffraff, if yeah. you will. Well, there's a <laughs> there's an article where uh, the title is "Suspect Admits to Doing Meth." Um, and cre- and having acts believing that the purge was happening. So uh, a man was arrested Saturday, uh, and this is courtesy of Fox 4, uh, was arrested Saturday from <laughs> being on top of an abandoned building. He took some methamphetamines and believed that the purge was about to happen. And in, in order to keep people away, he was throwing rocks at them. So <laughs> I thought this was funny because if you think that uh, – if there's a purge is actually about to happen, the thing that I'm not going to do is get on top of a roof and throw rocks at people. <laughs> I mean, that's the worst case that you could uh, ever think of, of, of somebody trying to keep people away from you by throwing rocks. Um, so a court record states that the police were called out and uh, this guy was throwing bricks from the top and almost landed near a cop. He was five feet in front of him. Which, by the way, hey, great accuracy on that one. <laughs> they brought in the tactical response unit, and uh, he said the purge was coming to get him, and so he had to defend his uh, his his roof. So I thought that was kind of interesting. <laughs> the oh, roof. jeez! Like, if you thought it was going to happen, leg- legitimately, wouldn't you go out and like get some more weapons besides just rocks? At some point, you're going to run out of rocks. Yeah, yeah. I guess. Rocks are a little bit cheaper than guns, I guess. What are we, Ernest T. Bass? <laughs> like, what in the world is happening with that? Rocks. Do you know, mm. do you know how a guy with no teeth says meth? How? Meth. Meth. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. It's just stupid. That's a nasty, nasty drug. Uh, People losing mm. their minds over it. <laughs> um, the other one that I've got is a, a glove-wearing police officer dies after being bit on the hand by a feral cat on in a Texas university campus. Um, Holy crap. Really? Yeah. It was a feral cat. Dude, uh, police officer um, at West University A&M police officer died two weeks after he was uh, bitten by a feral cat while on duty. Uh, Corporal Monty D. Platt responded to the call about the wild animal. He got bit, and then uh, a week after that, he wasn't feeling well, went to the ER, and basically was given... um, some medication to prevent it, and then he had a reaction to the medication, and that's how he re- actually oh, really okay. died. So, I got you. so the um, uh, the cat didn't actually kill him. There's the medication to treat the, the cat the set feral him up cat. though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Feral so, cats. That was kind of uh, it was a sad news. Wacky, but it's sad. but it's wacky. Yeah. Like you don't expect that to happen. Yeah. Uh, Miss Universe contestant refuses to wear a bikini. Hmm. So this is a. Uh, Mm. This is kind of just an opinion piece, okay? Which, you know, I guess, but maybe you can. The listeners can tell us what you think. But uh, one of the contenders from the UK is trying to rewrite the ru- rules. Um, she won uh, Miss Universe Great Britain, um, and then instead of doing the traditional two piece during the the swimsuit mm-hmm. edition, she wears a traditional caftan, which is a, I don't uh, even know what that is. It's a bathing. It's a a, a bathing suit approved. Uh, for Muslims, okay. she's a Muslim, and this this has nothing to do with bashing Muslims. Mm-hmm. But I guess my question is, why would you enter a con- a contest mm-hmm. knowing that these are the traditions and the rules and stipulations mm-hmm. to only have to to break them and not live up to them according to your beliefs? Why not enter your own contest that you know you or contests that are appropriate mm-hmm. without having to? stoop down or whatever as you would see it to some someone else's values that's i didn't really understand you know a lot, i guess the article and a lot of the articles i read about this were basically hailing her as a, a symbolism for feminism mm-hmm. and uh, a symbolism for religious liberty but you're entering a, a an event that's actually privately owned mm-hmm. to try to upset try to upset the the rules yeah. of it so i just i didn't understand that so 
Thoughts on that? I don't know. I, I, to be honest, I wish that whole thing would go away. Uh, I the, think it slowly is. The bathing suit thing, like, I don't, what's the point? Like, I, I mean, I understand the point, but y'all, I mean, I don't, I don't really want to watch that, to be honest with you. I know. You I just know. found the only man in America that does. Well, look. here here it is again. I'm trying to I'm trying to do better eating wise, and I'm trying to do better by watching, <laughs> not watching the things I probably shouldn't. I hear you. So, for for me, like, I don't know. I kind of am grateful for. Her. Be like, all right, well, hey, listen, if you want to change the rules and you can get away with it, then I'm I don't have a problem with it. Did she was she able to keep going? And oh, and she you know, she went, but what? But once again, like it's a privately owned business and operation. Mm-hmm. That'd be like me walking into, you know, McDonald's and saying you got you got to serve Chick Fil A sandwiches, just because eh. it's a pri- I'm I'm dictating now my my rules, my philosophy, my my beliefs into a privately owned corporation, just because I don't agree with their, their rules. Well, but did they let her continue to compete with? With they did let her suit? continue to compete because at that at that time it would be a a, a media nightmare. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because, um, but once again, this is more of the PC culture coming into, regardless of you, how you personally believe right. you, you should and shouldn't should right. or shouldn't watch it. Um, but this is someone trying to bring, a, bring in political correct their own personal beliefs and, and trying to make a privately owned corporation try to change their uh, their their rules. So, uh, like I said, it's an opinion piece. Yeah. And well, I, I, I guess my question is: is it, is it written that you have to wear a two piece? Yes. Oh. Uh, they have okay. the, they have the different stages. You know, the evening, the formal, mm-hmm. casual, the talent. Because the, if they just had a bathing suit and be like, oh, "All right, well, I'm just going to go out and in nah, this," no. but it's, it specifically says two piece, yeah. then I but, probably wouldn't enter it. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, that's next year if you have a feminist with unshaved armpits that wants to come in and. Mm. Uh, did don't it? don't be mad if you don't win because you're not meeting up to a standard. And <laughs> right, regardless if I those standards you. are right or wrong, right. it's still a privately owned, mm-hmm. you know, uh, contest. I mean, like I said, be, yeah. be going to like a barbecue contest and you bring in corn and p- being pissed <laughs> that you can't enter the brisket com- you know, I don't know. competition. Like, I think this is different than like it wasn't. What was it? Garden Ridge. I, th- I think that's a, a different type of thing when you you join a company. Knowing that they're not, or they aren't going to give you uh, birth control, but then you get mad at, at them for having. That's birth Hobby control? Lobby. Yeah. Hobby Lobby. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. What did I say? Garden, Garden Ridge. Ridge. Well, yeah. Hobby Lobby. Yeah. Uh, this is a different than a contest and wearing a bathing suit, in my opinion. I mean. Well, I, mean, I, I guess we can agree to disagree on that, but that's <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. I, I think when you. When you enter into a contract, a private contract yeah. with, with a corporation, you have to abide by the rules. If, if the contract says you have to wear a two-piece bathing suit and you say, nope, I'm not going to do it, then I agree with you on that piece. Mm-hmm. But if it's just like written as like a bathing suit, but... Mm, well, the, the bathing suit she wore was basically like a muumuu. So, mm. I, I, but once again, it's... You, How when, comfortable is that swimming in, you think? Uh, probably about as comfortable as the uh, full body... <laughs> Uh, full body uh, running suits that a lot of a lot of the mm. girls I've seen had yeah. to wear too. So good night. But I if you sorry. if you can do that if you can do that in 110 degrees, mm. so be it. But mm. like I said, once again, it's just about a contract. Hey. And, and I I agree with you on that piece. If it, if the contract says you have to do that, then fine, and you shouldn't enter it if you know that that's the case. But yeah, you know. like I said, it has nothing to do if you yeah. view this as contest as sexist or not. That has nothing right. to do with it. Um. It's just having to do with a private contract. Yeah. What's your uh, next story? <laughs> well, my next story is a um, uh, man accidentally shoots a nail into his heart. And I know this might uh, Ouch. might hit home a little bit to you, but uh, a Wisconsin man drove himself to the hospital after he accidentally shot a three-and-a-half-inch nail into his own heart. Uh, he was doing some construction work around a fireplace, and, quote, I was bringing up the nail gun forward, and I was on my tippy-toes, and it didn't quite reach and have enough room, and I fired it before I was really ready for it. Uh, then it dropped down and fired and it hit him again. So oh. um, the thing that really struck me on this one is his quotes. He said, it didn't really hurt. It just felt like it kind of stung. I looked down. I didn't see anything, and I put my hand there, and, mm, well, that's not good. 
when I saw it moving with my heart, it's kind of like, I'm not going to get anything done today. <laughs> <laughs> so he saw it moving <laughs> with wow. his heartbeat. When his heart was beating, the nail was beating. Yeah. Oh. And then the fact that he looked down and said, well, I ain't going to get nothing done today. <laughs> what, was some of, what was some of his other quotes? You're telling me he had some funny quotes. Uh, he said uh, he had to go to the emergency room. Sure. And he didn't want to bother anybody and be on, on a, in a handle for anybody. So he just said, I think I'm just going to drive myself to the hospital. <laughs> Uh, he said, it seemed like the thing to do. I felt fine other than having a little bit too much iron in my diet. <laughs> he, said, he said he leaned over to the security guard when he got there, and he said, hey, I got a nail in my chest. It'd be great if you could find somebody to help me out here. I'm just going to sit right down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Oh, you got, man. The guy's actually doing okay, right? Yeah, yeah, he's so doing fine. What what a uh, a wonderful spirit about him to oh, yeah. take something down and just laugh at it. Yeah. Know, because... That could have been his last few hard beats on earth, man. If that hit me, it would have been awful. I would have just cried <laughs> and got down in the fetal position and just wet myself. I think I couldn't imagine. Yeah, Mm-mm. yeah, I couldn't either. I've, I've had some, I've had some major pains in my life. But I've never right. shot myself in the heart, you know, accidentally with a nail. Listen, the only thing I've ever looked down and I said to myself, "Well, that's not good." Is like a paper cut. You know, if anything mm. other than that, I go screaming to my wife saying, "Fix me, fix me." Mm. I had an old neighbor once, <laughs> and. uh Old man Pete. Old man Pete. And uh, I, actually, he was. <laughs> Every good story starts uh, with old man yeah, Pete. He was actually my grandparents' neighbor down the road. Nice. He uh, was cutting some rebar. Or oh, like no. some, or excuse me, he was cutting a center block wall. Mm-hmm. And unbeknownst to him, there was some rebar in it. Oh, and buddy. This guy was probably about 70 years old. And he hits the rebar, and the, and the, the skill saw he was holding, concrete skill saw, no. flies back and chops his nose off. What? So old man Pete, <laughs> he he grabs a handkerchief or this you know the red red bandana handkerchief uh-huh, out yeah. of his back pocket. He, sure he did. He picks up his nose, wipes it off, rolls it up in the handkerchief, puts that handkerchief back in his pocket, pulls out a cigarette, lights a cigarette, oh my gosh. starts smoking it, and then hops in his car and, and proceeds to slowly drive to the hospital. You are joking. Nope. One of the toughest men I've ever seen in my life. Oh my so, gosh. And that happened when I was like. Eight years old, and I still remember it to this old day. Old man Pete. Old man Pete. Old man Pete, is that you smell something funny right now? <laughs> mm. well, I just, I, I had the sense to pull out a cigarette. <laughs> just, just, you know, one puff, puff. No big deal. Yeah. But I, yeah. You wonder if he looked down and said, well, I ain't going to get this done today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, that or, uh, well, I guess I'm not going to need any Kleenex for a while. Mm-hmm. Oh, geez. So, yeah. so what happened with old man Pete? Did he get it? They, get got, it? they got to put it back on. How about it? Yeah. Mm. Which is pretty amazing for that, you know, oh, long, yeah. long ago, 30 years ago. So I'm surprised he didn't pull out some duct tape and just duct tape his. <laughs> it'll grow back. I think that was previous to duct tape, but yeah, oh, I'm surprised he pulled out like a stapler and just, mm-hmm. but yeah, old or man. nail Pete. gun. Yeah. How about it? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the guy that got hurt and stabbed himself with a nail gun, his name is Doug. Old man Doug. I feel like <laughs> every time I hear Doug, I always think of. The, the hangover Doug, uh, yeah. Doug, 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 yeah. Doug I can't like hear Doug and not sing that song <laughs> there mm. you go but you if it's gonna happen to anybody it's gonna happen to old man Pete or it's gonna happen to Doug right or, or, or like, some hey, white kid named Cody you know Doug guess what happened to Doug <laughs> Doug, Doug shot himself with a nail gun again that Dar- Doug Daryl Daryl that's a good one too the other brother Daryl and the other brother Daryl mm. alright so um, one thing I, d- I do want to bring up is there was an article that my wife sent me um, a while ago, and this was uh, uh, by Aaron Eden Lewis, and we'll have a copy of this on show notes. Um, and the article is called "I'll Tell You Where All the Good Men Have Gone," and it's basically just a, an opinion piece as well about how uh, men are no longer men. And it started way back, uh, way back when, when um, men had started to uh, to leave the household and and. Boys growing up at that point did not have any male figures, and, and the rise of feminism at that point, mm-hmm. and just how it, it, in our culture now, um, men are not considered men. And, and I've said that on the on the show before. Is like we were, it's the wussification of America. We've been getting a bunch of puds, puddings, and um, you know, you look at TV shows and media mm-hmm. where men are are around, and we are just we're labeled as buffoons and morons. You look at TV shows like Tool Time, Everybody Loves Raymond, Big Bang Theory, even HGTV, we see this over and over again where 
guys are completely clueless. Woman comes to the rescue, or child comes to the rescue, and over and over again they get helped by somebody else. And we don't have, I feel like there's leadership issues that are happening uh, in, in America because we don't have any good role models uh, for men. Um, so this article is pretty interesting. It goes from a little bit of that, and it keeps going to um, this uh, group called MGTOW, and you pronounced it MGTOW? MGTOW. And it's just a, a culture now where they're just kind of yeah, wiping sta- their It stands hands. for men men going yep. their own way. Yep. Um, and they're just wiping their hands of, of kind of any thing that's holding them back, and they're just kind of just being their own Yeah, they kind group. of – they've tried – a lot of them, it's an online community, and what from what I've read about them is that a lot of these guys have tried traditional relationships, mm-hmm. you know, want to get married, want to have a relationship, but uh, some of the women they're finding are not uh, ready for that or mm-hmm. – their priorities may be different and not saying all women are that way. Mm. So don't take it out of context, but um, I guess the pool of candidates they're looking at just either gold diggers or um, may not want to have a family, may Mm. not want to have kids. Um, So these guys, some of these guys have just given up and said, I'm going to do my own thing. Mm -hmm. And one of the the quotes from this article, and and I'll speak for myself, I don't want to speak for you, uh, but I feel like we're probably going to fall on the same, same road on this one is, um, equality, this is a quote from, from the article, equality is not always sameness. Um, and, and I have a, a personal belief that men and women are equal, but we're not same. And when I say that, don't, <clears throat> you can send your emails to mojo at Southern Fried <laughs> Philosophy. I'm just kidding. Is, is men and women just different. We're, we're wired different. We're chemically different. We're genetically, d- genetically different. I mean, we're, we're, we're just different. We're, uh, men are more Again, I don't want to get get people angry. More logical, while women are more relational, um, but we are different. That doesn't mean that we're not equal. That we're equal in the eyes of God. We're equal in the eyes of society. That I don't have any problems with, you know, women making the same as men. And I'm not trying to go back to the 1950s where, you know, women stayed at home and cooked and baked. Though I, I enjoy it when my wife does cook and bake. So I know. But for me, women are equal with men but we're just not the same and so well, there's nothing wrong with saying that you know there's and, not. and and but i think we that always feel like, we do yeah and but we always feel like we have to preface and then also add a, I'll add on the the extra notes like you know the, sorry no 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 i do the same right. thing but that's but that's how it's been conditioned right too. yeah that's true. so um because if you don't do that then obviously you are sexist mm-hmm. and that's something that like i said i think we've been conditioned to do yeah. So, so I, I thought it was really interesting. The article, well, like I said, we'll have it up on show notes. I'd really like to know people's thoughts and their opinions on, sure, on the demasculinization of, in I'd say America, but even the world. Um, they're showing statistics where the divorce rate is so high, mm-hmm. um, men can't live up to the, um, the, the expectations of women. I guess I could say, and that they have a, a different view of women have a different view of what men should be than what men think that they should be. Right. And so that I think helps with the divorce rate in, in America. We just, we're not sure of who we are. Well, I, you know, um, call me bigoted, call me sexist, but <laughs> and that's fine. That, that's how you preface it. No, I preface fine. by trying to be, I'm sorry, I'm not I, trying I, to make I, you mad. Because you know what? And, and because, when truth comes calling, someone's got to speak it, right. you know, and everyone is so, I don't know when it started, 2000, 2010, mm-hmm. when, when did the real push started, but we hear this, how many times have you heard in online videos, news, arguments, things like that, where the patriarchal society, this mm-hmm. patriarchal culture that we have. Now, I'm not saying that men are superior and we could dominate the boardrooms and this and that. Mm. Some of the top CEOs now in this world are women. Right. There's women leaders and prime ministers and presidents all over. The, okay. We get right. that. But the traditional model of father, head of household, mm-hmm. mother, caretaker of the kids that, that has worked for millennia. Mm-hmm. I mean, and I'm not saying things can't change and can't shift. Like our, our model, our house is my wife, actually works out of the house side of the house. I mm-hmm. work inside the house and also keep the kids at the same time. So that model works for us. Right. 
it should be individualized to the family. We shouldn't have to tear down these models that have worked because yeah. guess what? We've started tearing them down um, in the 60s, and now we have the highest rate of fatherless homes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because these guys don't know how to be fathers. They're taught yeah. to run. They're taught to st not to stick it out, that they're, there's, there's someone else out there they yeah. can chase. And it is leaving whole communities devastated. Yeah. Um, it, it is leading to not just that. It's leading to crime. It's leading to lack of education. Mm -hmm. And I don't care how much money we spend on education. We could... We could spend a million dollars per kid. Yeah. It's not going to stop the factor that these schools only have these kids a few hours at a time. I right. digress. But I'm just saying that this is how it happens. Yeah. And it's ha it has been happening for 60 years. And when, you know, the this war on poverty uh, started happening and when people start getting free checks, and this happens in my family too, I'm speaking, <laughs> preaching to, I'm preaching to my choir. Uh-huh. When it happens, you have fatherless homes mm. and because they don't need a man. Yeah. They get what they want, and yeah. they don't need a man. Well, and that's what the article said is over and over again, guys are being told that you're not needed, which at some point scientifically, you you may not need us. Sure. But we're being told over and over, I could do this without you. I don't need you. I don't. You're not required for me. And I think at the heart of a man is to feel needed and to feel like he needs to be a protector, generally speaking, that he needs to provide for his family, that he needs to be supportive of his family. And when somebody keeps telling you over and over again, you, you're not good enough, you're, you're not needed, you, we don't need you, I don't have to have you, like that at some point is going to affect your, your psychology and, no, and really do some damage. You know, and uh, this is, has also creeped into our government, too. Mm -hmm. And I hate, I, I, I'm not, I don't want to make this like an anti-government podcast, but you know, with the advent of affirmative action, mm. where you have to have X amount of females mm -hmm. and this and that. I'm all about females in the workplace. My wife is a very talented person in her field, career mm -hmm. field. Um, but if there's a candidate more qualified than her, mm -hmm. she doesn't deserve that, that job. Right. She deserves that the other yep. person is more qualified, yeah. regardless of sex, gender, whatever. Mm -hmm. So... Um, that's the things that kind of burn me up. These, the, when government tries to step in and help, mm -hmm. they usually hurt. I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's, right. it's, it's constant battle. Yeah. Um, so I, I just also segue into another article. We, we talked, we just, you and I discussed, I think at church, I think mm -hmm. it was with, um, that, uh, the semen rates in Western men mm -hmm. have dropped yeah. quite a bit in, um, in the last, what decade, I think it was. I don't yeah, know the yeah. article from it. So I think there's a lot of contributing factors. I think you, besides um, of this demas uh, emasculation, demasculation of men, mm -hmm. you'll start to see our, our, our birth rates drop yeah. just because there, women and men aren't connecting, and the ones who do can't, you know, can't produce. And yeah. um, it's it could be a huge cycle. I'm blaming so. cell phones for it, but that's a whole other thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm blaming my addiction to Chick Fil A. <laughs> What does that have to do with anything? I don't know. I just wanted yeah. to admit that okay. openly on air. All right. So. <laughs> Sounds good. But no, we'd love to hear yeah. your thoughts on that. You can email us. Um, you can also uh, private message us on Facebook mm -hmm. or whatever. But we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, because, and we may be off our rocker. We may, we actually may be sexist and bigoted. I don't, I don't it know. It could be. I don't know. All right. So uh, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to have with us uh, on the phone uh, the author of Still and Barrel, John Francis Trump. No relation to Donald. So we'll be back. You're listening to Southern Pride Philosophy. Words cannot describe how awesome Robert and his team at Webmerized are. In our time of need, Robert came through for us and devoted more time than expected to help our organization develop our new website. It truly is a blessing to have an individual that can speak to the average person not in the IT world in a manner that can easily be understood. The process of working with his team was painless, and I look forward to working with them for future projects. Our website is spectacular, and I'm really proud of what was developed by Webmerized. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Don't take Stella H.'s word for it and also Southern Fried Philosophies, but go out to webmerize.com, W-E-B-M-E-R-I-Z-E-D, or check out the sponsors link on our website. And if you mention the word biggin, 
and your order, you'll get 10% off. Check them out at webmerized.com for your web services needs. Welcome back to the Southern Fry Philosophy Podcast. Uh, today on the phone line, our featured guest is John Trump. John tr- is a uh, managing editor with uh, Carolina Journal up in Raleigh. And also, he has written a great book called Still in Barrels, uh, which is now available uh, on your Amazon and various mm-hmm. other sites. So uh, welcome to the show, John. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me. So where do we start? Uh where, where we? Yeah, I don't know, 1908. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what prohibition started in North Carolina was 1908. Right. Until 1938. 30 years. That's crazy. My first question to you, John, is how, how are you liking your name right about now? <laughs> yeah, uh, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll... I, I, no, I seriously thought of this thing because one of the reasons I said John Francis Trump on the book is kind of distance me. Sure, <laughs> sure. Not sure. I'm not sure if that works, but um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right now, I've got the book here. So, but maybe tell our listeners a little bit what the outline of the book and kind of what the book is about. Um, you know, it goes into a little bit of history because North Carolina has a sort of history with liquor. Like I say, the 1908 prohibition began. It didn't end until 1938, and they didn't allow distilleries here until 1979. Wow, and. Yeah, and the first, and everybody kind of avoided, I think, because of the, you know, the uh, paperwork and the obstacles they had to jump through, um, you know, proverbial red tape. And then in 2005, uh, Piedmont Distillers opened, and that was the first distiller, and they kind of came in and started coming in after that. Mm. I mean, you know, it takes a while. It takes a while to it takes a while to get going, especially with the rules, because you got the federal rules, you got the state rules. You know, one is you have to have a still before you could legally become a distillery, mm. right? Mm. So you get a still, and it's like, okay, now i got to figure out how to make it. So, you know, which kind of goes back to the moonshine and stuff, because a lot of these guys have 150-year-old recipe, mm-hmm. you know, and they were making it before. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, um, it's just kind of a, an easy transition. And the book, it, it delves into that a little bit and how tough, how tough it is for these guys. Mm-hmm. Although, you know, the five bottle law makes it a little easier. But I think what's what's really cool about the book is it's the stories mm-hmm. uh, from, you know, from basically Manteo to, to Asheville. Um, peppered it entirely throughout the state. You have moonshiners. You got people like Lee Ann, who's just a crazy marketer, entrepreneur. <laughs> um, who, yeah, who wanted to make liquor and uh, is doing really well. Um, Durham Distillery, they always love gin, so, you know, and uh, so they're going, they're making gin. And the, uh, Van McCoy in, in Mayberry, who was a monk for, uh, I want to say 20 years or so, but it was a long time, wow. contemplative monk. Yeah, and he came back to, to Mount Airy to care for his mother, and he said, well, maybe I ought to try making liquor, he, you know, because people look at wine and they look at beer, and I know Topo, for, in, for instance, in Chapel Hill, they look at wine and beer, and they do make beer, but... You know, they found a guy in Scotland County who was making organic, growing organic red wheat. Hmm. And and they're like, huh. So, you know, they, they filled with it and uh, found the formula. And uh, they're probably one of, one of the only ones who use, uh, make, all their products are made out of this organic, organic red wheat, hmm. 100%. Wow. Right. So they're aged and stuff now, too. And, uh, Covington Vodka. Uh, it's just made out of sweet potatoes. And there's very few of, of those. Um, I mean, it's just across the board. Everybody makes something different, and everybody makes something great. And I can honestly say, you know, from what I spent last summer doing, put 3,500 miles or so. <laughs> oh, wow. On, on cover, going visiting all these stories. Um, and uh, the, the, the stories are, are incredible. The Outer Banks rum guys. Uh, there's the guy in Charlotte, Seven Jars, who uh, mm-hmm. he, he, his mother knew of these uh, mason jars buried in the yard. Sounds like a Charlie Daniels song. Mm-hmm. But, it sure does. Yeah, there's Mace. Yeah, and uh, they were moving or, or or sold the property, and it's like, well, we got to find him. And he was she was out there in the dark with a flashlight, and he had a backhoe digging them up. And, <laughs> so they basically held the recipes to to what what they're making now and some other stuff, which he won't say. But I think <laughs> it's just it's just crazy story, you know, the calls and. Uh, in uh, Wilkes County, um, Copper Barrel, Wilkes County making moonshine. Mm-hmm. Buck Nancy's recipes go back generations and generations. So that's what's really cool about it. And when I started doing the book, I wasn't really aware of it. It's just kind of, wow, 
mm. you know, wow factor. So in, in the book, you, you give a little bit of an introduction, and then you go to the different distilleries and kind of hear their stories and things. And there's numerous uh, different distilleries that you go through. I, I don't know exactly how many, but there's there's a ton listed in the book. Is there an idea of having to go back and, and do another book because of the, the new distilleries that I are hope, popping up? I, I, hope, I hope so. I mean, that would be the plan. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, of course, it's not obviously entirely up to me. You know, um, because Blair is, is the publisher. But, yeah, there are, I think, 36 distilleries in the book. And what I did was I went by the ABC quarterly price list. And I cut it off in August of uh, last year because they were just coming day after day after day. There would be new ones on. Sure. And I think the state has close to 50 now. Wow. At least in the process. And there are, are well over 40 who have liquor on the shelves in North Carolina. That's crazy. Um, so, yeah, it is crazy. It, it's almost, I mean, it's not comparable to beer necessarily. And I think they're going to hit a saturation point at some point. But, uh, I mean, it's pretty prolific. Yeah, th- that was going to be my question. I think that we're getting to a point where there's a lot of craft beers that, that are on the, you know, in the market and around the, the cities now. At some point, do you see any saturation that's going to happen coming well, up with yeah, the beer I mean, and the, the you liquor? Gotta, yeah, well, you with beer or with liquor? Liquor. With liquor. Um, it was liquor, yeah. Uh, well, remember, we're in a control state. Mm-hmm. And so these guys have to, okay, they make their they make their liquor, go through all the things. You know, the bottle has to be approved, the label has to be approved, the whiskey's got to be approved, blah, blah, blah. So they, they get that done, then to sell it, to get it in an ABC store, they've got to travel around the state through, I, there are 166 mm. or seven, something like that, separate boards. Goodness. To operate individually, so you know if you're in Manfield, you want to sell in Stokes County. Well, you got to find a way to get there to get your product in the store. You know, you you got to sell the board board on it, and then and then if they do take it, put it on. I mean, sometimes you guys observe in ABC stores. Sometimes the spirits are prominent in North Carolina. Sometimes they're stuck in mm-hmm. the back or in a corner, and and at the same time you're fighting for shelf space. You're mm-hmm. fighting you're fighting against. You know, Jim Beam and Crown Royal and, uh, you know, all the the Azio products and Heaven Hill products. Mm-hmm. It, so Bacardi, you know, I mean, these, these guys are monstrous. And, and you know, I, they're literally just printing money. <laughs> so the, obviously, yeah, and the, and, and the North Carolina guys are up, guys and women are operating on a, on a shoestring for the most part, mm-hmm. you know, sort of a paycheck to paycheck, bottle to bottle type of deal. Um, so it, it's it's a tough road. I mean, it's tough in many, many areas. And some people may not know. I went on the the Bourbon Trail in Kentucky not long ago. I'm a, I'm a Kentucky guy, so uh, I've done that done that tour. And it, it's ironic how these American name brands, Jim Beam, Heaven Hill, whatnot, are all for the most part all owned by Japanese investors. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, uh, Suntory owns Beam and Maker's Mark, um, and Diageo is another big one. That's uh, that's Bullet and they also own Crown Royal. Uh, yeah, so there, there are very few. Um, Wild Turkey is, is Campari that's under that umbrella. Mm-hmm. Um, so right. there, are, there are just there are only several companies. It's almost like when you look at Big Beer, Embev, the Miller yeah. Coors, and a couple others. There's not a whole lot, but uh, but the, the cool thing about you know the distilleries and even in Kentucky because we went on a bourbon trail a couple of years ago too. What's cool about it is the product is still amazing. Right, so exactly. they're, they're not they're not cutting corners. They're not doing like what Seagrams did years ago and you know effed up four roses really bad. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, you know, so I mean they're they're staying true to the tradition and uh, you know I know there's there's a lot of the whole wicked weed thing, a lot of pushback against that, but it's kind of just the way of the world. Right. Do, how how much of this uh, entrepreneurial spirit? Um, you mentioned all these these large companies. You got Brown Foreman, Diageo, Bacardi Limited. Right, right. Uh, how much of the how many of these entrepreneurs are kind of doing this as kind of a spit in the eye of the big boys? Mm-hmm. Besides, you know, just trying to make a buck. Uh, yeah. Oh, I think that's. I mean, I think that's that's what it is too. They and, and I think the big that that's pretty much the crux of it all. Hmm. Because when you go to these distilleries, I mean, they'll like Esteban at Topo. He'll he'll pull out a Georgia Moon or something. Some maps produce Bacardi or, or not necessarily Bacardi because they don't make a rum. Although I think they might be now. But you know they'll they'll 
the guy at Broad Branch in Winston will pull out rum to taste this Bacardi and then taste mine. Mm-hmm. Right, because it's made the guys at Howling Moon in uh, in Asheville, it's just outside of Asheville. They use a, a condenser that's 150 years old. Oh, and wow. It goes way back in the family, and you know they're they're very proud of what they do. You know, and and they do it real. They do it just like it's been done. You know, for 100 years, except like you know Brian Call said, they don't have to pull a possum out of the mash tank. You know, <laughs> they got in there. Because it's more, it'll more sanitized. Right. Sure. But they're very proud of what they do, and they, they they do it for real. And there's a lot of care put into it, and they do it batch by batch. You know, mm-hmm. there's no big column still pumping it out. You know, like like Jim Beam, it comes out like a you know he's saw comes out like a stick constantly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's it's not that way here, and I I think that's that's part of it. I mean, they're not in it to make money because like some of these guys are just barely breaking even after several years. Right. They're there to, to, to do a craft, and, and and even when they were debating, you know, HB 909 in the in the legislature, one of the lawmakers said this is not a, because there was there are always arguments about liquor, the demon whiskey, uh, you know, you know, it, it destroys lives, so on and so forth. But this is not about liquor. It's not about alcohol. It's about entrepreneurship. It's about helping these guys thrive and survive and thrive. Um, sure. So yeah, that's a big, that's a huge part of it because you, uh, you know, and you talk to them, and they would say in a book, and they're like, "Why the hell did I start this? I mean, <laughs> right, right. What was I, what, what was I thinking? You know?" But I say but that almost it, every it, day it, I wake up. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's it's cool that you know they they've progressed this far and just stuck to it. Yeah, no doubt. It it really is a craft when we go through and. I, again, I've gone through the the bourbon tour, and even in that, even the the mass production, it's still really cool to see how some of them are, have been doing it for for such a long time in a, in a period. And um, there is a lot of respect thrown for for people that are using those hundred year old stills. Right, imagine competing against mm-hmm. Crown Royal, which <laughs> I think I was up there last last October, I think, and they were. I mean, they've got like sixteen warehouses, mm. floor to ceiling with barrels. So wow. this is what this is what they're competing against. Yeah, you know? guys that have stashed millions and millions of barrels in, in the in these warehouses, and you know I think North Carolina spirits. I mean, you, you, and I always tell people this when, when I do those findings and stuff. Is there's no reason whatsoever to buy a white liquor that's not made in North Carolina, right. mm. whether it's whether it's vodka, gin, or rum, uh, even you know moonshine or or, or white whiskey. It's just so much better than the mass-produced stuff. Um, now, where where Kentucky has an edge, obviously, is the aging. They've been doing it, mm-hmm. you know, since Prohibition and probably sooner. So, you know, it, it's going to take us a while to catch up. And, and, and when we do, it's, it's going to be really something. Um, and since you've been to all these distilleries here in North Carolina, in North Carolina, we, just in case no one took, Ge- or a geogra- geography class in school, <laughs> you know, we're pretty much a long state, but we do have a coast that butts up to us. So obviously when you mentioned the rum on the, uh, on the coast and you have, mm-hmm. uh, we have the, the white lightning or corn, corn whiskey here. Uh, you, I think you mentioned gin also, D- does any like heritage or, uh, where you may have had German heritage settle in an area, does that have a factor? Cause I know, here where we're at, you have a lot of Scotch Irish, so you see a lot of uh, very similar recipes to what they call poutine right. in Ireland. So I'm just yeah, yeah. I mean, like I say, a lot of these recipes, like I was saying, Howling Moon, had, you know, came from their ancestors um, who brought it here, and they followed it along. Who were Scots Irish in that case, and uh, Ollie Mulligan in uh, at Great Wagon Road down there. I don't know if you ever been there, but you need to really check it out. We'll mark um, it down. Yeah, the yeah, the broken smoke is he's got a bar right next to it too. But uh, his grandfather was arrested in uh, Ireland for I, I believe it was his grandfather for uh, you know making poutine on the eve of Christmas Eve. You know, oh. so it's, it's just kind of <laughs> and yeah, he's still got the the, the clipping. Um, wow! So it's just kind of a tradition. Um, you know, as far as gin, you know, you're talking about gin, as far as gin goes, most of these, they, they spend just hours and hours and hours. Like the Durham Distillery has a very innovative 
vacuum type of process to, to, to make their gin. So they put a lot of time and effort to, to, to get the botanicals right. And, um, you know, Sutler's make, makes, makes a great gin. Um, there's, there's a pine pop in Raleigh who's just got incredible gin, which, which I've tasted and, and I was at the distillery, but I, and I, I said, can you know, can I get a bottle of that? Cause it has good, you know, and, He's like, no, uh, it's on the ABC stores. Yet. <laughs> so they have to, yeah, right. It's got to get there first. Um, so yeah, I mean, a lot of it's a lot of it's legacy, but a lot of it's just hard work and experimentation and, sure. and doing it. So, so you get it right, and you know, like, like Troy Ball, you know, with the with the heirloom corn, makes they makes an, they make an incredible whiskey from this corn that John McIntyre grows. But um, it took several years to to get this. You know, it's not like Jim Dean where the recipes on the you know on a database somewhere. right well I, I guess I you know the one thing uh I think any state that you go to you should probably check out any mm-hmm. local yeah. distillers you know because uh something that they may make in Louisiana a corn whiskey will make it will probably be totally different than North Carolina because I know a lot of these distillers especially ones we've seen have been very prideful of their North Carolina um grown products it's uh, obviously Louisiana, Texas. I mean, we're about to head to Texas this weekend, so I'm sure we'll pick up a bottle well, of something there. So it's got to be different, I, I would imagine, just like the beer. Well, yeah, it, it, yeah, and what's what's important is, is the agriculture aspect mm-hmm. of this too. Yep. Because North Carolina Department of Agriculture was really instrumental in getting this getting this thing going and pushing, you know, the North Carolina products like the wheat and the heirloom corn and honey, you know, mm. from the Outer Banks and uh, blueberries or, or whatever it may be locally grown and and these guys really try i mean we don't have barley necessarily i mean they are malting they are always starting to malt it around the state sure um corn and but you know juniper we're not going to grow juniper <laughs> you know for the gin and there are certain things you can't get but I, I i think for the most part like the sweet potatoes are all totally homegrown i mean we're up to a word like the number one sweet potato producer in the world north carolina is. really right. so yeah, so it's really, um, you know, a, a commitment to local products. When they say grain to glass, or you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's kind of it's kind of what the deal is. It's, it's so local. And Jeremy Norris at Broad Slab in Benson, um, you know, he he grows his own corn, huh. and uh, he, yeah, he's got a farm, and uh, you know, he does everything from you know from basically the ground up from. The field to, to the bottle, wow. which, you know, when you're buying, getting a Jim Beam or Jack Daniels or whatever, I'm not saying that stuff's not good because it is. Mm. <laughs> it's great. I drink enough to know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you don't know where that corn's coming from. Sure. You know, you know what the mastel might be, but you know what where the corn's coming from or where they're getting their rye. But here you do. Just ask them. Yeah, that's one of the things I really appreciate in the book is you were just saying that it it not only boosts the economy of the distiller, but the farmer that has sweet potatoes that could go wrong, could go bad, but because you don't need that good right. of a quality for that, you could throw it in the mash hop, you know, and, it's, and corn it's, and exactly things like that. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Well, that's why they did it. They did it that they they were throwing so many sweet potatoes away because it is uh, Yamco is a is a puree company, you know, so they puree mm-hmm. pumpkins and and, uh, you know, hermetically seal it and everything. They were throwing a lot of sweet potatoes away hmm. because when you dig them up from the ground, I guess there's a machine that takes them up. And if they're not, like, perfectly, look, you know, they don't look enough a food line or heresy or whatever, <laughs> right. they, they have nothing to do with them. Hmm. So, hey, let's puree them and make vodka. Yeah. So, you know, uh, that's how that happens, which is uh, really, really cool. John, is there anything that you wanted to put in the book but you weren't able to or anything you wish you could have put in the book? No, not really. I, I think I just wanted to get across more than anything how tough it is and, and mm-hmm. um, how, how special these guys really are. Um, because a lot of people, and I, and I know most people don't realize that they're out there. Mm-hmm. That's and, true. You know, and, and it's like in Kentucky, it's like Disney World or, <laughs> or Tennessee, you know, and Gatlinburg. Mm-hmm. Where every eighteen people are standing around the table doing shots of, you know, blueberry lemonade, fizz, moonshine. Mm-hmm. You know, it's and they use neutral grain spirits. Most most of them do. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't need the flavor. They put fireball in it. Oh, it's, oh, it's cinnamon. Right. 
but but you know the stories were so great, and I you know really wanted to wanted to highlight that. Um, you know, obviously it's a, it's a truncated version of the stories because you know you have editors. So, <laughs> right. Well, I mean, you know, they, they were they were cut down a little bit. And originally, I wrote the book as I separated it by spirits: with mm-hmm. vodka, you know, gin, moonshine whiskey and then you know bourbon or whatever but uh publisher wanted it sort of as like a guide mm-hmm. you know across the state because they've done books about beer and about wine um so you know that that's was the evolution of it but i mean i, I really had a good editor so i mean it's i'm i'm happy with it i hope there's yeah. another one. and well, because and things have changed legislatively um as far as the growth goes too well, I have an idea for you, and I'll, I'll be willing to be your uh, driving dummy or uh, <laughs> guinea pig. So, if you want to do a barbecue companion, I'll oh. that way you can, you know, what what barbecue restaurant do you go to in this distiller's neck of the woods? I'll be more than happy to help you out with that. So, uh, as far as uh, me, well, be be eating. I'll, I'll go with you and help you determine which restaurants we need to we need to put in the book. Okay. I mean, you can write the book. <laughs> I mean, and that's that's a, you know as far as bars go too. Uh, the bartenders are kind of getting getting the idea that yeah, this North Carolina stuff's pretty good. Right. Um, you yeah. know, if I, some... I think I saw on Facebook Lee Katrinsic of, of Durham. He said uh, he was at a bar and he said, "You guys have conniption gin here," and the bartender's like, "No, we we don't carry it. We don't have it." And he says, "You have to step up because usually it's like, what? What'd you say?" <laughs> you know, it's like never heard of it. Right. But at least they're at least, at least they're realizing that it's out there and it, it is an option. Well, I know here in Charlotte, we've seen a lot of uh, the uh, higher end ba- higher end bars or higher end restaurants actually bringing in the independent stuff mm-hmm. and the craft artesian uh, liquors and actually making some pretty cool one off custom drinks. So yeah. hopefully, that's a trend yeah, that we can do we we see happening. Jordan Kuiper, I don't know if you know him or not, but no, um, yeah. he who was at Salem Tavern. And he really, really pushed the North Carolina spirit in every cocktail he made, um, which was really cool. So, and now he's sort of the uh, the brand ambassador, so to speak, for North Carolina spirits. Um, I think this distillery association kind of hired him to do that, um, to, to talk to bartenders and that type of thing, to to, to get it, at, you know, more prominent. So, so people. And it drives me crazy, you know, when I sit there and say, oh, let me have a Picardian and Coke or, <laughs> you know, Seagram's and 7 and 7. It's like, yeah, come on. It's, but it's, our, but yeah. it's our lingo. That's what we've been trained to do. Mm-hmm. Just like when you say, when you have to look something on the Internet, what do you say? You know, have you, right. go- I mean, have you, you Googled know, it? You don't go to the bar and give me a, say, give me a Bud Light. At least I hope not. <laughs> <you know? laughs> but we've been, we've been conditioned that way. So it's, yeah. that's just part of our, our uh, nomenclature that we've got to change. We we talked a little bit earlier before we started recording, but then um, you mentioned it later. How are the laws changing, and what's the future of craft distillery in your eyes? Um, I mean, I think they took a huge step with uh, the five bottle law. You know, now you can buy five five bottles a year. And the brunch aspect, the media, most of the media picked up on the brunch aspect right away. You know, because it helps restaurants. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the ten a.m. on Sunday, and it's it's all local approval. But, you know, it's used with the tastings. You know, before they couldn't go out to festivals and stuff like that and do a tasting. So there was really, it was really hard to figure. You had to be either visit the distillery, you know, or, or go spend $30 on a bottle and, and then decide. But this allowed them to get out, you know, more, more into the public. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I guess it was a huge step. I mean, I, I went to most of the legislative hearings and uh, followed this thing along all the way. And, uh, you know, it was, it was it was a tough road. It really was because there are, you know, several legislatures. And, and they don't equate, I mean, drink a, a beer or a glass of wine or a shot, all the same amount of alcohol. Mm-hmm. But in their minds, it's liquor is bad. Right. You know, plus, you have the ABC lobby fighting it, too. So, you know, I, I think as it progresses, there were things that the bill that didn't get like, for example, direct sales. So, you know, the problem here is you have a distillery that you can't send it from the distillery to the customer. Mm-hmm. They've got to go through another party in another state. Right. So all the excise tax and everything goes to the, that state. Hmm. So 
we're losing all that tax money because lawmakers won't approve the liquor, you know, direct shipment type of deal like wine or whatever, as long as it's reciprocal, you know, but, you know, that, that got shut down. So there's, there's many things that, that have to happen yet for us to be even anywhere close to Kentucky or, or Tennessee. Um, but I think that now they're realizing that it's a boon to the state and, it, and, it, and it's important. And although you're, you're still going to have your, um, you know, the religious side of it, uh, it's the entrepreneurship, I think, is starting to win mm-hmm. out. Yeah. So um, I'm, I wouldn't expect anything for a while to happen again. <laughs> you know, but, that was a big one. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll see. Well, math is not a not our politician strong point, especially when it comes to tax revenue. So we we can spend millions and billions of dollars on putting a toll road by, with tax dollars. It's crazy. So yeah, I, I was surprised. I went to the Concord Town Hall not long ago, and the the big issue there was uh, private clubs and being able to to sell alcohol and not have fifty one percent of food sales. And, and right, that, right. that passed with flying colors. The thing that threw me was they everybody got in an uproar about uh, having chickens in their yards. That was the that was the thing that everybody was fighting <laughs> on. <laughs> I still want to go back. To, I still want to go back to the possum and the uh, and the steel. That's why I, I, I want to try that out. Well, that's well, I'll tell you what. You know, working in Raleigh, like a, you know, with a Carolina Journal, because we cover legislature, and uh, you know. It's, you don't really want to see the sausage being made. <laughs> <laughs> no, nobody wants to see that. Absolutely. Because it's, it's uh, one lawmaker, I, I think I wrote it in a story, you know, a, a crowler where you get a can of, you can mm. they, they allow, yeah, that opens up to have crowlers now, 32 ounce cans at, the, at breweries. Oh, wow. And uh, she asked, will you tell me how they're sealed? And I, I, I was sitting back there and I was thinking, <laughs> It's a can. <laughs> so, well, how do you? They're sure they're steel. It's a can. Yeah, I mean, you know, nobody sells open cans of anything. <laughs> so you know, it's it's you know, just sometimes you gotta you gotta shake your head, and just just realize the uh, you know where you are, and it, exactly. and and I think what the stillers appreciate is it's you know progress, a little mm-hmm. bit of progress is yeah. better than no progress. And they do seem to work really well together. In in Concord, they have a lot of um, uh, craft breweries popping up, but they all support and love each other. And it seems like that's the same way with the distilleries that they they want to encourage each other and they come together as as a group to try to help lobby and try to make the laws better oh, for yeah. them. So and they, that's cool. which is really cool too because they share barrels, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, all, you know Mother Earth and Kinston, they use mash from the beer and. Ollie in uh, Gray Lighting Road and Mash from Old Mech, which is hmm. you know right across the street, um, and and the cooperation of the, they have to because you know the, the, the monster is, is basically you know rising waters left all ships, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and they're, they're pretty much the more the merrier type of thing because the more there are the more lobby power you have, True. the better you're going to be to push things through through the legislature and now ultimately you know make money and, and get noticed. Yeah. So it's, it's a pretty cool dynamic. I, I, um, I know this isn't local, but um, this is one of my favorite scotches. Uh, the Lafrogue Cutter Cast. Oh, my gosh. Or, uh, which one did you do, Cardass or the Car- Cutter Cast? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, that's, I think I probably say Carneas. Yeah. They they sent me a sample of a, the latest release of the Quarter Cast. Because mm. um, I, I, I also have a blog for liquor.com. Right. Um, so you know, I, I review stuff there. I saw that. I saw and that they, post, and I was, I was smiling. <laughs> so. Yeah, they uh, they sent me the and that, that, that stuff's so incredible. And I like it. It turns a lot of people off because I I also got a twenty five and a thirty year too. Mm-hmm. And uh, it turns a lot of people off because it's funky. It's really funky and peaty, but uh, it's 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 really delicious. That that is good stuff, and I think. In North Carolina, you think you get the quarter cast, an older one, and the ten year, but you know that's another thing. It's kind of kind of limited. Right. Um, one of my favorite bourbons, as a matter of fact, is Kentucky Spirit Wild Turkey Kentucky Spirit, mm-hmm. which you can cannot buy in North Carolina. 
for whatever reason. You got I got to go to Virginia to get it. <laughs> um, which I mean, it's part of the control state thing too. It's you know, it's it's, it's all control. So no, absolutely. One guy can't say, "Oh, I'm gonna carry it for you." You know, no. Mm. It doesn't work like that. I, I guess you could ask them. They, they they could give you an order a case for you. You know, but right. um, and you got to buy it. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's kind of. You know, I've had uh, uh, I love Freud is awesome. Oh yeah, I've had um, several people that have never had scotch, and I've had that bottle at my house and let them try that. And uh, so, you know, like I said, you have that love hate because it's uh, very very smoky, like a campfire in your mouth. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But they yeah, went, and, but right. they went and tried a the scotch. Lore, at, what's that? The lore, the Lafroy lore is the really funky. One. Oh yeah, I don't know if you've had it. I had, yeah, actually had that in a bar in Durham. So yeah, it's. Uh, that's good stuff. Yeah, but people go try if they've never had scotch and then have that and then go to have a you know, just a regular uh, scotch afterwards. Right, they're they're yeah. like, "What's missing? Something's missing out of this." So it's uh, a yeah, you know, what's cool too is all whiskey is good. You know, I mean Ireland's really that's really sweet. Um, oh yeah, you know the smoky scotch and Canadian blends, which is it's pretty fascinating how they hate the, how they blend that whiskey and stuff. I think Crown uses uh, four or five distillates mm-hmm. in each bottle. Um, so it's pretty amazing how they, how they blend it. Um, everybody has their own technique and their own process. And, sure. Which is cool about North Carolina, too. Everybody does does it differently. And I can't push North Carolina spirits enough. I really can't. Mm. Well, I'll tell you what, we're going to wrap this up. But we before we send you on your way, we have a segment called 10 and 1. And uh, basically, we ask you 10 questions. See if you can get them under a minute. And Biggin has the, uh, as always, has the uh, the questions on hand. So, would you like to play? Okay. Sure. All right. All right. So in this, in the, uh, <clears throat> we'll go ahead and get started. In the book, you talk about ABC stores. Uh, ABC is it easy as one, two, three? No. Angel Share or <laughs> Devil's Cut? Devil's Cut. <laughs> Favorite distillery <laughs> you've ever toured? You could drink it. <laughs> Favorite story I've ever thought. Well, that's beans have been really good to me, so I'll take Jim Beam. If you could share a drink with anyone, who would it be? Probably Anthony Bourdain. Moonshiners, is it real or fake? Oh, it's... <laughs> Huffington Post or actress Juliana Huffington? I don't know Juliana Huffington, but definitely not the Huffington Post. <laughs> <laughs> uh, finish this lyric. Uh, just good old boys. Never mean it, no harm. There you go. Uh, one bourbon that you haven't tried yet that you want to probably pappy i have tried pappy but uh, i want to try it again still in barrel or crosby stills and ash <laughs> still in barrel <laughs> and uh the last question is what is your spirit probably burgers all right there Amen. you go well done also john so tell cool. tell our tell our listeners where they can find your book at and also if they want to read uh, some um, you articles find it you online um you know barnes and noble amazon um blair publishing has it too and I and now it's in some of the Barnes and Nobles and uh, check your independent bookstores. Also, uh, also some of the distilleries uh, we found ours mm-hmm. at a distillery. So uh, yeah, yeah, exactly right. right? I don't I don't always that out. A lot of the stores have bought it too. So yeah, sure. And when you go support the distilleries and buy the book, absolutely, yeah, definitely. All right, we appreciate you coming on, John. Thank Thanks, you, sir. John. We appreciate your time. All Thanks. right, Bye. all right, bye bye. John Trump, you're listening to the Southern Fried Philosophy Podcast.